Community Conversation Series. My name is Ann White, and I am pleased to uh, welcome Alyssa Nicolin of CORE. Uh, she is a former nurse that is integrating her clinical side to her newfound knowledge associated with CORE. And I know as we um, were meeting one another at the beginning just a short while ago, I went, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, so here's to learning lots tonight at the Community Conversation. Thank you Welcome. very much, thank you. And I'm happy to be here. This is a very important community conversation for us to have, and today my hope is once you learn a little bit more about donation, that you'll go home and talk to your family about what it means to make that decision on your license to be an organ donor. So as Ann said, my name is Alyssa McClellan, and I do work for the Center for Organ Recovery and Education. My role at CORE is I'm a professional services liaison and donor family support liaison. So what I do is in the hospital when someone meets the criteria for organ donation, I actually sit down and talk to their family about that opportunity, what it means for them to be a donor, how they can live on through organ donation, and potentially fulfilling their last wish that they put on their license or living well. So I'm going to go over a high level overview of what we do at CORE. We're actually located in Pittsburgh and if anyone has any questions you can feel free to ask throughout. And then I have a couple special guests here with me today. So our mission at CORE is we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting donation, education, and research for the purposes of saving and improving the quality of life through organ, tissue, and eye donation. Our vision at CORE is that every potential donor will make a pledge for life, so they'll actually put it on their license and make that pledge to be a donor. And then our values that we live by every day are integrity, compassion, quality, responsiveness, education, innovation, respect, and life. This is our facility. It's located in RIDC Park in Pittsburgh. How many of you knew we had an actual donor hospital? Yeah, a lot of people don't know, so it's very exciting to share this with you. We welcome people to come and visit us if you're in the Pittsburgh area. We are one of two organ procurement organizations in the state of Pennsylvania. The other part of the state is covered by Gift of Life Philadelphia. Currently, we cover 155 hospitals in West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, and a small area in New York. We are a federally regulated organization, and we're not-for-profit. We were founded in 1977, and we're building our program day by day. This is a perfect example of what we're doing at CORE to better serve our donor families. We now have an OR, ICU, and capabilities of doing everything that we can at the hospital in our own facility. We also welcome families to come with their loved one. And then just to let you know, there are 58 national organ procurement organizations other than CORE, but the regulations are pretty much the same everywhere you go. This is the closest here? Yes, okay. in Gift of Life, Philadelphia. So this gives you a better look at our service area. We cover six million people in these areas, and we're currently working with six transplant hospitals. The real reason why we're here today and why this is such an important community conversation is because all of these individuals were touched by donation. Currently, I will get to our national waiting list. There are a lot of people waiting for a life-saving organ transplant, and we have people in this community that have received the gift of life, that are donor families, or they're currently waiting for that call, that they will receive a life-saving gift. So to put it in perspective, how many of you have been to Heinz Field and PNC Park in Pittsburgh? Yay, okay, good. So if we combine those two very large arenas, that doesn't even encompass the number of people waiting for a life-saving organ transplant. So that just shows you out of all these people, there are more people waiting for a life-saving transplant. And that number is sadly currently over 121,000 people. This is all ages of individuals. Today I currently ran data and found out that there are over 8,000 people waiting in Pennsylvania alone. Of those individuals, there are 118 people aged 1 to 5 years old that are waiting for a transplant. And for those individuals over 65, there's 2,000 people waiting. So it's very, it could be that you know someone that's actually waiting or is touched by donation. 
So here's an interesting fact for all of you. 90% of people say they support donation. What percentage of people do you think actually designate themselves on their license? Does anyone want to guess? 25. What'd you say? 25. 25, okay. Only 46% of individuals are actually designated on their license. So that shows there's a lot of myths and misconceptions and there's a lot of education needed to help people understand the importance of making that decision. If you say you support it, then talk to your family about it. Consider making that pledge for life and putting it on your license. So some statistics that are very important for all of you to understand is, as I said, the numbers continue to rise. There's over 121,000 people waiting, and those change on a daily basis. Each year, more than one million people need life-saving and life-improving tissues and cornea transplants. Every 10 minutes, another name is added to that very long list of individuals waiting. And sadly, around 18 to 21 people die each day waiting for a life-saving organ transplant. So the real reason why a lot of people don't put it on their license in talking to healthcare professionals, people in the community, leadership members, with the organizations that we work with, is that a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions and there's a lot of education needed. How many of you have heard the saying that if you're in a terrible car accident, someone's gonna be rummaging through your bag looking to see if you're designated? Yeah? So that's one of them, but I'd like to talk about some of those with you. So the first myth is that doctors will not try to save your life if they know you're a donor. Well, I can tell you I'm a registered nurse by trade. I work with 15 different hospitals. Everyone's main concern is saving your life and doing everything to get you out of the hospital in the normal state that you were prior to coming in. No one at the hospital knows if you're designated on your license. That's not their job. So it's not until they actually refer a patient to CORE in a situation that's very critical where we would check the license and see if you're designated. This is a prime example of a physician who was seen outside of a hospital after losing a very young patient at 19 years old. He was seen by people in the hospital crying. He was very heartbroken that he lost his patient, and that's just a reminder that their goal is to save your life. They're not going to be focused on whether you're a donor or not. If one of their patients does become a donor, they're very excited that that patient can live on, but that's not their primary concern. Next is that your religion does not support donation. All eight major religions actually support donation, and the Pope has even encouraged those to make that decision because it's considered a life-saving gift to give one life to another. The next would be that the rich and famous on the U.S. waiting list for organs get preferential treatment, and this is actually false as well. When we run lists for transplant, it's all based on your height, weight, and blood type. So that's information that we put into a system, and those listed, it's the most critical patient that would receive a transplant first. So it's not about whether you have a ton of money or your race or your age, none of that. It's all really determined on how sick you are and how high you are on the list. So examples of individuals who you likely know who have been touched by donation are Dick Cheney and Walter Payton. Yeah, just a few. There's a lot of people that are touched by donation every day. Cheney goes donation? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then another myth would be I am too old to donate organs and tissues. This is also false. We, we really look at every patient and see if there's an opportunity for donation. So we tell our hospital partners that make sure you refer every patient regardless of age or medical history because they may be able to help someone through donation. The oldest donor in the history was 94 years old. And it's important to know that we are really we recover hep C organs for transplant because there's individuals waiting for a life-saving transplant with hep C, and John Hopkins is now evaluating HIV organs for transplant, so that's something that we will assess as well. So there is no true medical rule out. And then finally, my family will be charged for donating my organs. 
Once I talk to a family and we obtain authorization for donation, CORE covers the cost of the process. So it's at no cost to your family and there's no benefit to saying yes to donation either. No financial gains. And donation will disfigure my body. This is a typical myth that comes up and it's very sad to me. We have a, don we have a um, volunteer for, Erie, for our Erie organization and his son was a donor at a very young age. I believe he was 21 years old when he passed away of an unexpected cardiac arrest. He was able to donate tissue and cornea and he shares that when he went to his son's funeral he would have never known he was a donor. And that's important for him to share so that healthcare professionals and people in the community understand the impact and that you can still proceed with your wishes of having an open casket funeral. And then finally, I'm too sick to donate. And that I've already explained. We evaluate patients individually and we really do our best to see if a patient would be suitable for donation so that we can give that family the opportunity and help their loved one to live on. So how does donation work? The process takes place in all of our hospitals that we partner with and the nurse is responsible for making a referral to CORE when a patient reaches certain criteria and that's typically when there's discuss discussion of end of life care, brain death, um, withdrawal of care, we're notified and we do a quick evaluation over the phone. If a patient appears to be medically suitable for donation, we would send a coordinator to the hospital to talk to the physician and the nurses and kind of determine where the family's at. Our priority is supporting the family and making sure that they're ready for that conversation. So there's a lot that goes into this case, cases um, for donation. We talk to palliative care, social work, case management, and make sure the family's truly supported through the process. The hospital would then proceed with brain death testing. We would obtain consent for donation and we would start to do everything we can to place those gifts. So there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on. We're checking lab work, past medical history, current health status, and determining if this patient is a perfect match for the recipient who's waiting for the gift of life. We then would coordinate with the transplant surgeons and follow their request to make sure we're recruiting the organs and optimizing the opportunity that this patient and their family has given us. So how, go ahead. how long does it take you to get to the hospital? So typically, like for example, in the Erie community, I'm close to every hospital, so they would dispatch me right away during the week and I would go to the, the hospital within 15 to 20 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the time I'm actually at a hospital, so I would respond right away. If I'm not available, we have a whole team of people in Pittsburgh that are dispatched and they'll come on site within a few hours. Mm -hmm. And we have continuous communication with the hospital staff. And they keep you on a ventilator? Mm -hmm. In order to be an organ donor, you have to be maintained on a ventilator for adequate perfusion to your organs. So that's a big misconception as well. Ann and I were speaking earlier. You can't actually be an organ donor unless you're on a ventilator. So that's why it's important for people to understand if you're in a car accident and you pass away on the scene, you're not going to be able to be an organ donor, but you of course will be able to help through tissue and cornea donation. What tissue? Wait, she'll tell you. No, no, it's fine. I appreciate the questions. There's a lot of different opportunities. If someone tears an ACL, that could be from a donor. If someone is a burn victim, they can receive a life-enhancing transplant in that way. And then, of course, corneas can give the gift of sight to two people. How long before they, you, you could uh, take the tissue? So it has, to take, it has to take place within 24 hours from the time of death. So it's kind of a fast process, but we have plenty of time because we give the family time with their loved one. We have to contact the coroner, the funeral home. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that we're working on, and then we would work with the hospital to make sure we're getting there in a timely manner. So specific to brain death in the hospital setting, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about brain death and the opportunity to donate in that way. This is all driven by hospital policies, but most of the time the hospital has to complete two brain death exams by two separate physicians. This is a very important process 
the physician is pronouncing someone deceased and they take the, they follow the policies directly. So one neurologist with specialty in neurology and then one critical care physician, they'll each do an exam and then they do an apnea test to see if you're breathing on your own at all. So it's a very thorough test that takes time and they ensure that there are no responses to anything in the exam. So when they're checking for your pupils, cornea, cough, gag, they're not seeing a response. So they should be telling your family all along the way from admission that their neurological prognosis is very poor and start to talk about end of life and prepare you for this decision. This is an example of a first person authorization and designation on their license. So as you can see, organ donor is under her name. We have access to the DMV so we can run a record and see if someone made that wish for themselves. We talk to the family regardless if they're designated or not. We want to offer this opportunity to all families. So this is why it's important to have this discussion with your family because you know, no one anticipates that something's going to happen to them at a young age or they're going to be someone that would be in a tragedy. And they don't think about their wishes. And then we are approaching patients that are very young, their families, and they just don't know what their wishes were. And it's very conflicting for them. So if they can say confidently, Alyssa wanted to be a donor, this was her wish, or it was on my license, that helps the family tremendously. So just talk to your family about that decision. What is the comms slash med restore or something? What is that? And that's the B? The C-O-M slash? Oh, you know. that is just the registration it looks like. I'm not on the license, you mean? Well, I have two stars on the backslash. Someone know what that is. Yeah, I'm not sure. But we would clearly be able to identify if you're an organ donor underneath your picture. And it's different in each state, but we would know if you're registered. And we would talk to your family about fulfilling your last wish. Now, this is equivalent to an advanced directive or living will. So if you make this wish, then our organization is going to do everything we can to fulfill your wish and advocate for those patients that are waiting. So what can be donated? What is it, what is your second what if the family doesn't want it? And, if the and it's still on the um, license. Right. So we've had, that's a very rare situation that that happens because the way that we talk to families, we don't go into the room and just say, we're here to talk about organ donation. We actually sit down with the family, get to know them as a person, learn more about the patient, and then we eventually get to the part where we would say, I'm not sure if you know, but your loved one graciously designated themselves on their license. And we've had families that may be shocked by that because they didn't know that that was their loved one's wish. But once we start to talk to them about the kind of person that their loved one was and the rare opportunity of donation, most families fully support their loved one's wishes. If they wouldn't, we would have to involve legal and ethics and work with the hospital in that regard just to really talk to the family about this was their wish. They're going to be able to save the lives of several people. We really want to do everything we can to fulfill that wish. Yeah, the bottom line is what? The bottom line is if you made that decision on your license then, and you're suitable for donation, then you would be a donor. No matter, no matter what? Yes. Okay. Transplantable tissues, as you had asked, ligaments, cornea, bone, skin, vein, tendon, and heart valves. Tissue donation is considered life enhancing, but I always like to say that to me, cornea donation is life saving. If I was not able to see and receive the gift of sight, that would definitely be life saving to me. So it's important to know the impact that donation has on the lives of so many people. The transplantable, um, when we are recovering organs for transplant, there's different time frames that we have. So you probably see a lot of TV shows and it looks like a rush process. Well, it definitely is a rush process, but we facilitate the entire thing with the hospital, and we're making sure that the surgeons are out on time so that they can go and transplant the gifts into their recipients. So just to let you know, heart, we have four to six hours to actually recover the heart and transplant the heart into the recipient. Lungs, four to six hours. Liver, 18 to 24. And we can now place kidneys on a pump to continue to recruit the kidneys and transplant them. So our organization
organization, we're going to exhaust the list that we have and make sure that we're placing as many organs as possible so that we can save lives through donation. So if a surgeon says no once we recover because it's not suitable for his recipient, we're not going to stop there. We're going to continue to go and do everything we can to transplant those gifts. And then as we discussed, tissue and cornea, we have to recover within 24 hours and then the placement varies. So the impact of one donor, making that decision on your license, you could potentially save the lives of eight people through organ donation. We have someone today that was touched by a donation and received a life-saving transplant. So he will share his story with all of you. And one tissue donor can improve the lives of up to 50 people. So really remarkable. Um, you can really make a difference by making that pledge for life. Just to let all of you know, we have a really extensive bereavement program, and we're really proud of that. Our donor families come first in all that we do. The support <coughs> starts in the hospital setting, but does not end there. This goes on for 12 months. So in the hospital, we do handprints with the families. We offer memorial cards to the family that are free of charge. They can pick an image and a poem, and we'll deliver those to their funeral home. We offer them a plaque, it's called My Final Gift, that they can keep with them. Some families choose to leave that with their loved one. And then we have a special place ceremony each year where we invite all of the donor families from the previous year to come together and share their experience and grieve together and know that their loved ones made the ultimate gift. And then some additional areas in donation and transplant, just to let you know, transplantation is coming so far. We just recently um, attended an AOPO conference in Texas and we learned about hand transplants and how they successfully completed the first hand transplant, which I'll get to. And there's a lot of talk about living kidney <coughs> donation within the community and being a living donor. How many of you have heard of that? Okay, and I know there was talk that there's advertisements through the community looking for a donor, things like that. That is becoming more and more common because if you revert back to the numbers I showed you, there's over 101,000 people alone waiting for a kidney transplant. So a lot of individuals are going forward and going through the process of being tested to determine if they're a match for their loved one, neighbor, friend, and there's a lot of living kidney donation occurring within the community. So. That's really remarkable to know the impact that that has and the ability to donate through living donation. Well, that'd be the quickest way, wouldn't it, for order, order? Yeah, because, you're, because the list is so long, most kidney transplant recipients are waiting anywhere from roughly two to three years um, from those that I've talked to, and that's a long wait. Most of these patients are on dialysis and they have no quality of life. so. We have a volunteer in our group, her daughter's waiting for a transplant, she's waiting for a kidney, and she has been waiting for a while now. So she is running a full campaign to try and increase awareness on donation and living donation so that she can increase the chances of her daughter receiving the life-saving gift. So there are individuals that just step forward and say that they want to donate to someone or someone may know someone that's waiting and they choose to go forward with that. So it's, like I said, it's becoming more and more common and it's a really remarkable thing. We had a town hall last year in Erie and the transplant surgeon spoke to the fact that you only need one kidney to be healthy and live, func be functional and live fully. So that's something that more and more people are considering. Advancements in Pittsburgh, the first hand transplant plant occurred in Pittsburgh. There have been eight hand transplants on five patients since 2009. The nation's first double hand transplant and total forearm transplant was completed. So this is a woman who received a face transplant which significantly, significantly in, improved her quality of life. So in the past, this was something that was not even thought about or possible, and now this is how far transplant has gone. And what we do at CORE in the community and within the hospital setting 
And pretty much every opportunity we have is we're trying to increase awareness and the important importance of donations. So you may see commercials we have, we have a Facebook page that you can follow us on. We're constantly sharing stories and the impact of donation. We have a large volunteer group in Erie of roughly 50 individuals who have been touched by donation. We meet once a month to talk about what we can do to increase awareness in the community and provide more educational opportunities. We also have a living donor coordinator. We have education focused on the youth, workplace, multicultural, and faith-based. How to show your support, you can like us on Facebook, you can follow us, you can go to core.org and learn more about donation or opportunities that you have maybe for volunteering or just being a part of our educational programs. So how you can help today is to consider signing up to be a donor, putting it on your license, talking to your family about that. You can of course register on core.org or just learn more about what it means to make that decision. All of these individuals are healthcare partners of ours that help us to increase awareness and help to live our mission every day. How many people work at CORE? We have roughly 200 people that work at CORE. Mm -hmm. And where is your funding come? Just the, where do you We're a non-for-profit organization, so we receive a lot of donations. And then some of our tissue processors, um, you can receive money in that regard, too. It's not for the purposes of, as I said earlier, there's no financial gains to saying yes to donation for a family. But some of the tissue processors that we work with, too, we do receive compensation, and then, of course, from Medicare and Medicaid. What is the cost of the memorial services and all that? For a family, the memorial services? Yeah, like the plaques, like you're talking about. Oh, all of that's free of charge to the family. That's just our bereavement program that we offer to individuals. So in every case, we offer a handprint to the family. We give them a plaque at every case, and then they have the opportunity to choose a memorial card as well, and up to as many as they'd like. So we quickly produce those and then have one of our coordinators deliver them to the funeral home for the family. And then the program that I spoke to, the special place ceremony that occurs once a year, we invite all donor families. So this past year, we had over 900 individuals attend and they have the opportunity to actually create a quilt square for their loved one, and we make quilts that travel all across our donor service area. So it's a really good memorial for these families. And these are two, this is um, Kyrie, who just recently received a life-saving transplant, and Nico, who is also a transplant recipient. So important to know that Transplantation affects all ages, donation and transplantation, as I mentioned, anywhere from one year old all the way up to, you know, any age that's waiting for a transplant. So I'm now going to introduce my special guest, which is Dave. He actually received a life-saving heart transplant, and I'm going to have him share his story and connection to donation, and then we can answer any questions you have after that. How's everybody this evening? I do have a little talk, but I, first of all, I, I'd like, like a show of hands. How many of you here have ever felt that you were sick and that, you know, I need to get to the hospital or something like that? Did you ever feel that way? No. Did it turn out to be anything serious? Yeah, for you. <laughs> yeah, I had a heart attack. Well, that, that would be kind of serious. Yeah. Okay, but most of us, when we get sick, we tend to think, you know, it's indigestion, it's something, but, you know, a lot of times it's not. So what I'd like to do is just share with you my story. When I was a kid, when they very first came out with organ transplants, you know, to be an organ donor, I signed up right away because, I don't know, I just didn't even think about it. I thought, you know, I can be an organ donor because after I die, I don't need my organs. And I remember my brother and my sister, they were very critical, you know, of what I was doing. And I explained to them, you know, hey, you know, if I die, I don't need my organs. And they kind of backed off. 
And then we never even talked about it. And I spent my entire career as a printer and uh, never even talked about it, never even thought about it. Well, in uh, 2004 it was, I got laid off. I was permanently laid off. My job was eliminated. And I started embarking on a new career. Uh, my wife and I, we got to go to Europe. Uh, our daughter was studying in Europe. We got to go there. And I had, I had signs of not being well, but I just kind of shrugged it off and being an old man. Well, an old man. So, but um, anyhow, you know, I started to a new career as a financial advisor. And I was really excited about it because it was something totally different that I had ever done before. And uh, I did that for about a year or so, and then my whole world got turned upside down. I started to pass out and for no particular reason. And uh, the one time I passed out right in front of my wife, and what it felt like to me, it felt like I just laid down on the floor and got back up and went on my very old way. And she says, you know, you're either going to the emergency room or you're going to the doctor. And I said, well, if that's the case, I'll go to the doctor because that'll take longer. <clears throat> so I got an appointment with the doctor and he checked me out and he says, I'm going to put you in the hospital for more tests because he says there's something wrong, but I don't know what it is. Well, I argued with him. I was, I was very mad. I says, no, I'm healthy. You know, I'm, there's nothing wrong. The doctor walked out of the room and he says, you know, I don't have, have time for this kind of crap. So he walked out of the room, he came back, and I just started all over again that I was healthy. And he said, look, do you want to live or do you want to die? Well, that kind of got me thinking. So I went into the hospital. And that hospital visit, I remember they put me on a, a, a treadmill. And I remember being on that treadmill for about two seconds. And the next thing I knew, I had a pacemaker defibrillator. And they told me that I had an enlarged heart. And man, I was mad. I was just steaming mad. Because I was healthy. You know, I mean, I'm totally healthy. And there's nothing wrong with me. But anyhow, I got, I got this pacemaker defibrillator. And I, I started to feel pretty good. So, you know, I was working at my new career. I was really enjoying it. <laughs> But a year and a half went by, and then my heart just started to give up. Uh, at first, it was just minor things like uh, being short of breath, getting tired faster than normal. Towards the end of 2007, I was getting a lot worse. I remember Thanksgiving of 2007. My wife, and, my wife had her family over the house, and we had everybody over. We had Thanksgiving dinner. And after dinner, you know, you got to do the dishes and put the chairs away and stuff like that. We got all that stuff done. And I told my wife, I says, I'm going to lay down for a while because I'm really tired. Well, apparently, I slept for 24 hours. And when, I, when she woke me up, she said, you know, she says, how do you feel? And I said, lousy. I, just, I felt just as exhausted. When I woke up is when I, when I laid down. And she says, well, what do you think we should do? And I says, I think we should go to the hospital. And for me to say that, that was like, yeah. it was like such, it wasn't me. It wasn't me talking. I mean, I would never volunteer to go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital, and they fixed me up, and I started to feel better. But I mean... After that, I spent most of my time either in bed or in the hospital. I was very sick, and I didn't know it. <clears throat> in April 2008, I was hospitalized again. My cardiologist came in, and he says, I can't help you. He says, there's nothing I can do for you. And, um, well, I actually backed up, and it was, it was one of the other visits. And he says, you're going to have to go either to Pittsburgh or Cleveland to get more intensive care. 
Well, we went to Cleveland, and the main reason that we did was our daughter lived in Cleveland. So my wife had a place to stay while I was being evaluated. Well, they told me that I needed a heart transplant. And because of my condition, I didn't realize, I didn't even know what that meant. So on April 12th, I was in the hospital again at St. Vincent and Erie, and uh, I was lifeloided to Cleveland Clinic. And a funny story about that, I had to wait all day because that day there was a great big accident on I-90, and there was like every ambulance and every uh, caregiver was on I-90 because there was like 200 cars in this accident and there were people that were, you know, that had to be tended to. Well, they said the only thing that was available was a uh, helicopter ride to Cleveland. Well, my first thought of that was like, this is really great. I'm, I'm going to go to Cleveland. They're going to patch me up. I'm going to go see the Indians because it's the beginning of the season. I said, life is going to be great. It was impossible for me to think or even comprehend how sick I was. I was so sick that I spent the next 182 days in Cleveland as a patient. For the first three months that I was there, I thought I was doing pretty good. You know, I was getting up, I was walking around, I was a pain because I wasn't sick. I was told, my wife told me, she says, you better change your tune because the doctor said, if you don't change your tune, we're going to take you off of the list and you're going to go home and you're going to die. Well, I guess I started to comply. <clears throat> but I thought I was doing well. On June 17th, they came into my room and they told me that they were going to take me in for surgery and put me on an artificial heart. And I'm like, okay. You know, I, I didn't even didn't even know what that meant. Well, they took me down to surgery and they brought me back to my room. They said there was a heart available. Well, apparently somebody else was sicker than me. And uh, they took me back into surgery and they put me on an artificial heart. Now, for does anybody know what an artificial heart entails? No. What they did was they opened me up and they took the ventricle chambers, the bottom half of my heart, out. And they put a plastic pump in. And then I had a great big machine that ran the pump and the pump was inside of me. And then uh, for the next month, I was in and out of intensive care. Nobody knew if I was going to live or die. I didn't know. I had some pretty rough times. I remember they would come in at 4.30 in the morning and they would put, take a chest x-ray. And then right after they would leave, I would start to fall back to sleep. And then they'd come to draw blood. And I mean, it was just an endless thing. So after about a month, I started to perk up. I have no idea what the doctors did. They said that they had three artificial heart machines. And at different points, I was on all three of the different machines before they got one to correspond with what I was, what my body was like. And when I came out of that surgery, and when I started to realize I had a eureka moment, I thought to myself, wow, I'm screwed. I need a heart. And that was, you know, it's like either I'm going to get a heart or I'm going to die. And that was the very first time that I realized how sick I was. At first, I had to do rehab, and I remember two male nurses would get up, come into the room, and they'd grab me underneath the shoulders and just haul me out of bed. And then they'd tell me, wow, you're doing a great job. And I'm like, cut the crap. I says, you're just pulling me around like a rag doll. I says, I can't even feel my legs underneath me. Well. That was the first time. They came almost every day and they pulled me out of bed and they got me to walk. And I, I still remember, like it was yesterday, the first day that I walked out of my room, 
I just broke down and I cried. Because I didn't think I'd ever see the outside of the hospital room. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, they said that I was strong enough to go to uh, rehab, cardiac rehab. Well, that was kind of funny because they took me in a wheelchair and they put me on a treadmill. And if it would have went any slower, it would have stopped. And I walked for two minutes and I was totally exhausted. They took me off of the treadmill, put me back in the wheelchair, took me back to my room. I slept all afternoon. I was so exhausted. But slowly, you know, day by day, I started to walk a little more, a little more. Their goal was to get me to walk walk for 30 minutes and climb stairs if I could. <clears throat> so, I mean, that that's what I did. I hung out and uh, I walked and I, I got so good that I went to rehab every day and then in the evening, if a nurse or two was available, they would drag me around and I would walk the floors. So, I mean, I was putting in a lot of miles and uh, I did, I, I started to get stronger. Well, on September 24th, of the evening of September 24th, my nurse came in and says, have you talked to Gonzo? And I just looked at him and I says, who's Gonzo? I said, the only Gonzo I know is on Sesame Street. And he says, well, Gonzo wants to talk to you. I have no idea what he's talking about. Well, he walked out of the room, and Gonzo calls on the phone. Dr. Gonzalez, it was. He was Gonzo to everybody at the hospital. And he says, I got some good news for you. He says, we found a heart for you. However, exact words here, the heart's been exposed to malaria and TB. Do you want it? Now, I invite anybody to be in my place there. What would you say? I had no idea what to say. And I kind of stammered. And I said, well, I have to consult with my wife. And he says, that's fine. He says, I understand. He says, you have 15 minutes to decide. I'm like, okay. So I called my wife. She answers the phone, and she ran the same question by me. She says, what are you going to do? And I says, well, I says, I think I'm going to take it because I don't know if I'm going to get another opportunity because I'm an O negative, and O negatives are very rare. And I didn't know if I'd get another chance. Well, it turned out to be the best best decision I ever made because as soon as I hung up with Tina, Gonzo called back and he says, what did you decide? And he says, I think I'm going to take it. And he says, great. He says, relax. And, you know, he says, we'll take care of the rest. Well, I mean, I was, I couldn't believe the peace that I was, I wasn't nervous. I, well, like I said, I talked to my wife, I talked to my two kids, and they came, and I've got a great picture of going into surgery. It's a selfie. And uh, I thought it was great. I thought it was great. It's one of the best pictures I ever took in the hospital. So, but the surgery went real smoothly. It was about six hours that it took. And it was like, I was like brand new. I woke up quickly and I never really looked back. You know, I had some small problems, but nothing like it was before the transplant. After... Why well, the heart transplant was on the 25th, and I believe it was October 2nd, they released me to go to the guest house. Well, the guest house is right next to the hospital, and it's a motel-type environment. Well, I went there, and I was terrified because I was losing my security blanket. I no longer had a hospital to fall back on. <clears throat> well, I went to the guest house, and... My wife turned into the rehab Nazi, and she would make me walk and climb stairs and everything. And after about four or five days, she came in the one day and she says, we're going to go on a trip. I'm like, great, where do you want to go? Well, she took me to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And man, I'll tell you, that was the best present I ever got. 
because it took me away from the hospital and the hospital environment. And I got to enjoy something totally different, something that I hadn't experienced for at least a year, maybe a year and a half. So, I mean, that was great. Well, on October 17th, I went home. I, w I went home for the first time. And uh, I just turned eight years old. And I love life because I know that God gave me a second chance. And God doesn't give out second chances. My dad always had a saying, he says, when the good Lord calls you, you can't say, wait a minute. And the good Lord called me, and then he said, wait a minute. I always had a joke when I was really sick. I said that when I was that sick, God wasn't collecting the garbage. So, But uh, anyhow, I try, I try to help out doing anything I can possibly to help other people. Because, I mean, I, I got a tremendous gift. I mean, something that I just, no matter how much I give, I can't replace. I can't give enough. Um, you know, my only sad thing is that I wish I could meet my donor family. Because my donor family it had a connection to Guatemala. They said the person either lived in or traveled to Guatemala, and that's why I was exposed to malaria TB. But I, I wish I could meet them and show them that my donor isn't dead. My donor is living in me. You know, and I mean, I just wish I could do that. But since the transplant, I, like I said, I help out as much as I can with anybody that I can. And I have a friend of mine, he's wheelchair bound. And uh, I take him to doctor's appointments and do therapy and a lot of stuff. We just kind of keep each other company. <clears throat> and then we also uh, collect clothes for an annual clothes drive that we have in Erie. A couple highlights of what has happened since my transplant. About three years ago, we went skiing in Colorado. That was something that was on my bucket list. And uh, funny story about going skiing. I went and I put the skis on, went down the mountain once, took my skis off, and I was done. Yes. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I was terrified. I was just scared to death to be on skis. And I knew that if I was supposed to do that, I was gonna, I was gonna either kill myself or break an arm or a leg. So I quit. But it was a great trip anyhow. Uh, some other things is on October 10th of 2010, Tina and I got to walk our daughter down the aisle. And we got to have her to get married, and then now we have a three-year-old grandson. And as of uh, July 3rd, we have another three, uh, just born grandson. So I mean, I know that I've gotten some things that are just tremendous, and. Um, you know, I, I'm just enjoying the second chance at life. I have a book that's over there on the table, and if anybody wants to take a look at it, it just kind of, uh, it's a summary of uh, my life in Cleveland for that 182 days. And it's entitled Mr. P Unplugged. And the reason it's Mr. P is because people would come into my room, and my name is Dave Petrovich, and people would say, Dave, uh, and I said, Mr. P. I said, it's a lot easier and you don't have to worry about it. So, and the unplugged is, means that I'm not plugged in to an artificial life support. So that's my story. Thank you. Any questions? What was your age when you had the, um, your heart attack? I never had a heart attack. That's another thing. I mean, I never, when I first went to the cardiologist, he says, you didn't have a heart attack. You don't have cholesterol problems. You don't have an, you don't have anything. He says, you don't have no problems. All I had was an enlarged heart. I was diagnosed when I was 49. I was three months before my 50th birthday and I was transplanted when I was 53. And then when you were doing the physical therapy, I kind of missed that. Were you doing physical therapy on a 
artificial heart. Yep, yep. Hello, I got pictures. So that was in the artificial heart was next to me. So you had and, to do all the physical therapy with the artificial heart. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. Oh well, yeah. And they would. They had two leads, and they went in right here, right underneath my rib cage, and they were airlines that drove the pump, you know, wow. in and out. And the funny thing about that, I mean, when I first came out of surgery, I'm laying there and they're telling me to relax and take a nap, and it's like, you try to take a nap, and your chest is heaving up and down, and it's like, impossible to relax. I mean, it's like, I remember it took uh, a sleeping pill and two Tylenol every night for probably the first two or three weeks for me to just fall asleep. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't relax. I mean, it was just, and after a while, I just, it got to be second nature. You know what's your age now? I'm 61. 61. Just turned eight years old. On the 25th. Wow. And my wife says I act every bit my age. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.